Hello, I'm David Brown. I'm the chair of the INS History Committee, and we are uh, carrying out interviews with various of our distinguished scientists in the International Neural, ne Neural Network Society. Our guest today is Dr. Robert Cosma. Dr. Cosma holds a PhD in applied physics from Delft University of Technology of the Netherlands. He has two masters in mathematics from Ethos University Budapest, Hungary, and from tap power engineering from Moscow University of Energy, Russia. He's founding director of CLEON, the Center for Large Scale Integration and Optimization Networks, FedEx Institute of Technology, the University of Memphis, where he has been professor of mathematics and also computer science since 2000. Previous affiliations include UC Berkeley at the Division of Neurobiology, where he started in the 90s his highly productive collaboration with Walter Freeman, which continued for two decades. He also served on the faculty of the Division of Information Sciences, Otago University, Dunedin, New Zealand, and the Department of Quantum Science and Engineering, Tohoku University, Sendai, Japan. For over 10 years, he had various involvements with the US Air Force Research Laboratory, Sensors Directorate. He has seven authored and edited books and over 300 papers in journals and in proceedings. His research interests include spatiotemporal neurodynamics, large scale graphs and networks, and the emergence of intelligence behavior in biological, computational and engineering systems. He has served on the governing board of the INNS and as president from 2017 to 2018. He has been elected member of the board of IEEE, Systems Man and Cybernetic Society, and the ADCOM of IEEE, Computational Intelligence Society. He is a fellow of IEEE and a fellow of INNS, and has received various awards, including the Gabor, a Gabor Award of INNS. He is presently the Editor-in-Chief of IEEE Transactions on NSMC Systems, a world-leading journal in cybernetics and intelligent control systems. Now, in addition, I would say a few more words about Walter Freeman, as mentioned above. Walter Freeman was an American biologist, theoretical and experimental neuroscientist, and philosopher whose pioneering research on experimental and theoretical aspects of oscillatory neurodynamics resonates strongly with us today. He studied physics and mathematics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, electronics in the Navy in World War II, philosophy at the University of Chicago, medicine at Yale University, internal medicine at Johns Hopkins, and neuropsychiatry at the University of California, Los Angeles. He received his MD cum laude in 1954. He authored over 450 articles and four books. He was president of the International Neural Network Society in 1994 and was a fellow of both INNS and the IEEE. He received the Bennett Award from the Society of Biological Psychiatry in 1964 a Guggenheim Fellowship in 1965, the Merit Award from NIMH in 1990, and the Pioneer Award from the Neural Networks Council of the IEEE in 1992. He was a professor emeritus of neurobiology at the University of California, Berkeley until 2016, when he peacefully passed away in his Berkeley home. And from personal experience, I would say he was a prince among men. Well, Robert, let us move on now with our questions. And to begin with, how did you get into the field? Wow, well, that's, a, that's a good question and uh, maybe not as straightforward as most of uh, uh, scientists uh, develop their career. So it's quite convoluted, uh, both in a 
in the sense of the research uh, topics uh, which we are uh, which I covered and uh, it's, uh, all kind of uh, uh, areas starting from physics mathematics biology engineering and so and so forth but also this trajectory was very convoluted in a physical space so it covers a large part of the globe and uh, maybe I will talk a little bit about that but, uh, but uh, just to start with how is uh, started uh, so I, I uh, actually was grew up in the family of mathematicians uh, uh, my parents were mathematicians my mother was a high school teacher of mathematics and the father also studied mathematics and uh, and I was good at mathematics. I was uh, one of the best in, uh, in among my peers, attended all kinds of conferences and uh, sorry, competitions, and, uh, and some of them I won. And uh, that means something because that was in Hungary and Hungary is considered uh, strong in mathematics. So, so that, uh, that gave me a kind of uh, uh, almost trivial choice that, okay, uh, I should uh, uh, continue as a mathematician straight, uh, straight on. Now, as it turned out, the real life was uh, much more uh, complicated and, uh, and, uh, and had, uh, uh, had more uh, turns along the way. Now, how, how this uh, really started, uh, there is uh, one important event I want to mention, I was a high school student and came across the book of John von Neumann, The Computer and the Brain. And this completely fascinated me because, uh, because it's, uh, uh, he, he was obviously uh, a top uh, mathematician, uh, phys physicist and uh, computer scientist inventor or uh, one of the inventors of digital computers as we know it. So, so whatever he wrote about this topic it was uh, very interesting. And, um, uh, and I thought, wow, if I could uh, do that uh, in my life, uh, study brains and uh, computers, that, uh, that's what I want to do now. As it turns out, uh, actually, it was not like that, but I'm really uh, very interesting uh, turn a full circle now after 30, 35 years. This is actually what, uh, what I'm doing. So it came true and I'm very thankful, uh, thankful for uh, that to happen. Um, okay, but that was a long time ago. So what, uh, what really happened immediately? First, I actually studied uh, uh, physics, uh, physical engineering, uh, nuclear physics. And uh, that was really my first part, uh, first 20 years. It took uh, about 20 years of, uh, of, my, uh, of my life. And uh, that was uh, uh, very, very interesting and, uh, and I enjoyed very much. But it, so after 20 years, really, ultimately, I, I switched more close to what we talk now about neural network. And uh, during this uh, uh, 20 years, uh, this first 20 years, so what, what I would, uh, would say as a highlight of that part of, uh, of my physics, uh, physics uh, career was I studied the different fields, the local fields and global fields and uh, in, uh, in uh, physics and uh, the interaction uh, local and global fields. And strangely enough, actually that was very useful and prepared me for a lot of things that later on I, I faced in, uh, in brain uh, dynamics. Now, um, that uh, in, uh, so after, after my, uh, my PhD in, uh, in this applied physics that was in the Netherlands, then I, uh, I, uh, I moved uh, and worked in, uh, in Japan 
and then uh, New Zealand and ultimately moved to, to California, Berkeley, working with Walter Freeman and, uh, and uh, that's what really the new, my neural network life started as, uh, as, as we can refer to it. And uh, just, uh, ex just telling all about this trajectory, it uh, it's, would be interesting, but may maybe it's, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on that, but, but certainly, uh, what was uh, when I worked in Sen in uh, in Japan? It was uh, in Sendai, the Tohoku University, and uh, and uh, in uh, uh, quantum science and engineering. So really hardcore uh, hardcore uh, physics. And uh, Sendai, just people now know about it's near Fukushima, which unfortunately recently uh, there was the uh, tsunami and the follow-up uh, nuclear disaster. So I, this was just the place basically I, I lived and uh, and worked very nearby. So that that was Japan. Then I moved to New Zealand, and I think it was New Zealand when. Uh, there I worked with Nick Kasabo. Uh, that, that was the time uh, when uh, actually I, my focus switched from physics orientation to information and computer science. And this uh, switch uh, has been uh, accomplished really when uh, upon the invitation of Walter Freeman in the 90s, I joined his, uh, his uh, laboratory in, uh, in uh, at UC Berkeley, um, and maybe one more thing just to uh, to this uh, kick out uh, that how how it all started for me. My uh, first IGCNN meeting was in uh, in '94. Uh, it was actually the first wiki, uh, and uh, and. Uh, that uh, so that was in Orlando, uh, Florida, and you know, and that uh, that meetings I met, uh, uh, and then consecutive IGCN and meetings I met Walter Freeman, also Paul Verbosch, who was a very important uh, uh, colleague and also mentor for me, and uh, that just led me after a few years. Uh, that my flight to Berkeley, California, at one uh, beautiful summer or early, early fall uh, in September. So that's what it all started. Then, how about since then? What are your career highlights? And what can you tell us about your mentor, Walter Freeman? Okay, so that's a, that's a, that's a lot, but uh, okay, let's, let's start. So I, I mentioned that before getting into, uh, into neural networks, I, I studied in physics and sometimes jokingly, I say that, well, nothing much changed actually since my work in physics, because in physics, I worked with uh, uh, neutron, neutron noise, neutron like elementary particles and, uh, and the fields the, of these neutrons and so on. And what I'm doing now, instead of neutron noise, I am doing neuron noise. So the neurons in the brain and the oscillations which create the, the complex uh, spatial temporal pattern which, uh, uh, which uh, uh, produce the intelligent behavior and uh, all what we study. So, so that, uh, that's, that was kind of uh, very interesting. Now, the, uh, so all it's, uh, it's really started uh, in earnest in Berkeley. And uh, let, let me say a few, few words about uh, Berkeley. So at the time in the late 90s, uh, it was an extremely fertile uh, 
uh, intellectual challenging uh, environment uh, what I experienced uh, experienced there and uh, and uh, well so obviously I, I worked with Walter on uh, uh, on uh, neurobiology, but even uh, even when I worked with Walter, that was in uh, collaboration with the uh, electric engineering and computer science. Shankar Shasti had a big project, and uh, so what I was involved. So that uh, that that was one part. But I definitely uh, want to mention that uh, in Berkeley there was. There were at, at that time, and obviously now as well. But I had the experience uh, 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 interacting and working with, uh, with people like Leon Chua, uh, who's uh, with his cellular neural networks is one of the pioneers um, in the field. And now we are talking more about memristos in the case of Leon, but but. Yeah, so he, he was uh, very important. And uh, I definitely mentioned uh, mention, uh, uh, Lotfi Zadek, because uh, Lotfi was another, uh, another towering uh, uh, scientist and, uh, and uh, he, he organized, uh, it's, it's broader really than fuzzy. It's, uh, he organized the soft computing, the BISC Berkeley initiative of, uh, 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 of uh, soft computing and weekly, weekly meeting and uh, very intensive exchanges and so on. So that, uh, that, that was very, very important uh, to be part, uh, part of. And there were so many others, like philosophers like Hubert Dreyfus and the embodied cognition, the optometrics, the Larry Stark. So there, there are there are really really people uh, you you could uh, could work uh, and uh, interact with. So that's uh, that uh, that that was the Berkeley kind of uh, uh, env uh, environment overall. Now. Uh, specifically, obviously, I, I worked with uh, Walter Freeman, and uh, well, so Walter, okay, what can uh, you say about him? So he, he 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 was a giant of the field. Okay, I would say it's visionary pioneer, uh, uh, and uh, and he himself had a very broad. Uh, Broad, uh, broad uh, background and uh, interest. So, um, as I learned with him, he he, he really didn't want to get into neuroscience uh, for whatever reason. So he he tried to get into into uh, and he he studied at MIT engineering and he. He learned poetry and uh, and all, all all kind of things, but <laughs> the certain uh, the, the certain trajectories uh, apparently you cannot avoid uh, avoid. So uh, he he ended up to be an outstanding uh, uh, neuroscientist, but but with having a very broad background in uh, in both engineering, mathematics. Uh, uh, computer science and 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 humanities and philosophy after all and and that uh, that uh, that really was uh, was very I think that constituted him as a human being but also as a as a scientist and uh, so so that's why it is ob obvious that uh, that when he in, this concept of chaos in the 60s, early 70s came out, he immediately re recognized the, the importance of the field and fully embraced and used it for, uh, for his research and uh, uh, one of the pioneers in this uh, area. Now, of course, uh, uh, his main field within neuroscience was olfaction. Okay, I, I think uh, that, uh, and he did that for, okay, 60 years or so, or more. So that's what, uh, that's what uh, he was grounded. And, uh, and I think that uh, that was really, 
really uh, very important uh, in multiple ways. And now looking, looking back uh, that actually prepared uh, for, uh, for studies of more advanced sensory systems because uh, what I learned from uh, Walter that, that really olfaction is one of the, the most ancient, uh, if not the most ancient sensory systems, you know, the, the, the uh, or, or olfaction or the, in the water, the, the following the gradient, the amoebas and so on. So that's what it is there always. And, uh, and uh, then, uh, and even for uh, for up to the mammalian uh, uh, levels, the olfaction lower level, it's uh, it is very important, and uh, that uh, that is that um, that is uh, important because uh, uh, studying studying the olfaction as as he did and the pattern based computing around this uh, olfaction. Uh, prepared uh, him and people like me working with him to to extend those studies to other sensory uh, sensory systems, including uh, uh, you know visual, visual auditory and uh, and somatosensory and so on. And uh, and uh, that that is very kind of uh, interesting uh, aspect because. Uh, uh, it's obvious that olfaction has this periodicity, right? So when you inhale, then you sense. When you exhale, you don't sense. So, uh, okay, with less <laughs> degree. So there is this type of uh, underlying periodicity. And the question is that uh, do you have this periodicity in other senses? And uh, just I'm looking at you now uh, uh, on the camera, it looks like I assume that is a continuous process. There is nothing uh, respiration, but uh, but may maybe uh, we can discuss about this later. But actually, you can detect this uh, this uh, kind of uh, resemblance of this periodicity in other other senses, and that's uh, that, that's very interesting. But but maybe getting back, uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself. So let let's just uh, talk about the olfaction. Then, uh, uh, of course, Walter uh, Walter uh, developed. Uh, he had very solid mathematics uh, uh, and computer. Well, at that time there were no computers, but as soon as computers arrived, what, what the, uh, so they embraced them. It was the IMAC, I mean, the IMAX supporter anyway. The the point uh, uh, Apple, I would say, supporter and uh, and user, and uh, we had that in the lab all over. Now the uh, but it's important that. Uh, uh, for this uh, dynamic view on uh, on, uh, on on neural processes, spatial temporal dynamics, he it goes back to his uh, interaction with Kaczarski, Aaron Katzir Kaczarski, who is one of the pioneer uh, in the field in population dynamics in uh, complex chemical uh, you know, biochemical processes. Unfortunately, he was. Uh, uh, tragically assassinated in 72 by terrorists. So uh, Walter was very, as I learned from uh, him, so very, very, very upset about that. And he decided that he needs to carry on the uh, torch and, uh, and uh, really a lot of things what uh, later on uh, he worked with. And then I get involved, what now we call it uh, Freeman Kaczarski. Uh, models are uh, this hierarchical uh, uh, self uh, hierarchical approach of uh, self organized dynamics of different uh, structure and uh, and uh, and uh, functional levels in the brain and uh, this uh, this also relates to um, to to the of course the 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 self-organization in the context of Prigozhin, Ilya Prigozhin, uh, and uh, 
and the line later on uh, with uh, with uh, Herman Haken uh, and, the, and the open thermodynamics is non-equilibrium thermodynamics Haken and then then the, the complementary principle, if you wish, that uh, Scott Kelso and along just follow up this line, Steve Bressler, one of the first uh, uh, PhD student of Walter, uh, actually uh, also along that uh, that path. So, so that uh, that is, uh, I think, it's very very important, uh, just as a kind of uh, when, when I, I talk about Walter, just to give uh, this uh, broader uh, background. Now, coming back to the highlights, okay? Is, is that all right? So, okay. Uh, so, okay, so as, as I cover different aspects of uh, complex brains and neural networks, mathematics, neuroscience, and some engineering, so maybe I can, a little bit discuss about uh, or mention about those. Okay, so uh, the highlight in in the case of mathematics uh, is uh, is really going back to uh, to uh, to graph theory and uh, and network theory and uh, and. Uh, that the, what we now call a neuropercolation model. So it's a network theoretical model on criticality, criticality theory for, uh, for the dynamics. And uh, in, in that context, maybe I think it's important to mention that uh, uh, I, I worked on that very intensively when I uh, joined in Memphis in the early 2000, and uh, although I moved to Memphis, we still, uh, till his very last days, we, we collaborated with Walter. He was there with him in the very last days. So, but okay, so I, I moved to Memphis. Okay, what is Memphis? That's end of the <laughs> deep south. So, what you are doing in Memphis? Okay, so. Uh, all right, so there is one, uh, one, there were several reasons, but maybe one important thing uh, uh, people may know, I mean, most uh, scientists might know Paul Erdős. Paul Erdős, the network and graph theory guy who is another uh, leading, I mean, maybe one of the top mathematicians in the, in the uh, 20th century and uh, Okay, if nothing else, the, the small world network, you know, the, yeah, when we talk about the Erdős number, how it is your Erdős number, my Erdős number is two, I didn't write from Erdős, but I have a co-author and so on and so forth. So, so that, that is Erdős. Now, Erdős uh, was, uh, was uh, actually another Hungarian, but uh, he, he didn't live in Hungary, he, he was a world citizen in a real <laughs> sense. I, I, I believe uh, most of his life, and he spent a lot of time in in uh, in the United States in America, but uh, he didn't have any fixed point. He just didn't fit his style. He was just too active to get stuck in uh, any place, so he didn't. Uh, but in the maybe the last ten years uh, of uh, of his life, actually he built up. Uh, uh, a very strong combinatorics group. Uh, Ralph Fordy later became provost, and uh, and uh, many other people. It's very strong. One of the top uh, uh, combinatorics group uh, uh, in the country. Uh, because what Paul did in the last uh, ten years or so. He, he regularly visited, he still didn't have a permanent appointment, but he just had a semi-permanent regular visiting every spring or once, a couple of months per year, and, uh, and he really enjoyed. So that, uh, that, that created this network graph theory group there. And by the time I get there, unfortunately, he, he passed away few years before, but uh, there was Bela Bolobash. Bolobash is, uh, is one of the top uh, uh, 
grab the expertise from the University of uh, Cambridge, uh, UK member of the of fellow of the uh, Royal Society, member of Academy, different places. So he's he's very strong, and uh, and uh, I discussed with him about uh, this. It's my ideas about the uh, networks and so on, and uh, and uh, I saw that could be really exciting. So that's why uh, I, I was there, and uh, we worked uh, and we produced this uh, uh, this uh, series of uh, of uh, which is applicable, motivated by brains. Uh, using uh, graph uh, theory and including phase transition and criticality, edge of criticality behavior. Now, um, yeah, so, and then how it relates to neuroscience. So that we, we developed this, uh, and that is this neuropercolation, I would think it's, it, it, it is, this has been around for 20 years, but I am, and confident that it contains a very important breakthrough still ahead. Now about the, the neuroscience aspects and how, how this uh, relates and what, what, is, what is maybe the highlight in the neuroscience and that, uh, that actually, uh, uh, but uh, with, with uh, Walter, we called it uh, maybe the cinematic uh, theory of uh, cognition or perception. And uh, of course, Walter uh, uh, developed this theory for a long time, uh, but, uh, but it was more intuitive. Uh, and uh, so after uh, we started to work together, we could give it a more formal, rigorous, mathematical, uh, framework and uh, and to this cinematic theory and, and maybe just uh, uh, one one way to in a high level I can express when I just mentioned that when I look at you it looks like the visual uh, perception is continuous so actually it is not but there are some uh, uh, some and what we call in the cinematic theory some frames and uh, metastable frames for maybe 100, 200 milliseconds. And then uh, there are uh, a couple of such a frames in a second, but that means that every second, the brain kind of shuts down for uh, briefly and then it uh, rises again. So that, and that is, uh, can be described uh, and is described as a phase transition in the brain. And uh, of course, uh, there are mechanisms to smooth it out on the surface. So we are not exploding with our brain five times per second, but that's what actually uh, is underlying the cinematic theory and cognitive phase transitions. Uh, and may, maybe I, I mentioned uh, the, the engineering aspects as a highlight because that, uh, that is also, also important and uh, that relates to the embodiment of uh, this mathematical and, uh, and biological series on engineering design and uh, uh, it relates to the embodied uh, cognition and, uh, and uh, so um, one example which we are very proud of that we had a work with uh, NASA and in the mass rover, the autonomous learning uh, mass rover prototype in the, uh, and, and uh, we developed this brain inspired mechanism that the robot learned without actually prescribed rules, the environment and navigation and uh, multi-sensory fusion. So that, uh, that, that I think it's a very, very, very important highlights. And also I, I, want, I can mention that with the Air Force, when we worked about sensor networks and the flexible and efficient operation, of sensor networks that uh, that another very important uh, engineering application of 
Mathematica and the brain inspired series for efficient uh, engineering systems. Okay. At the present time. Okay, so that uh, so what uh, what we are what we are doing now. Okay, so as far uh, as far as the mathematics, um, so when uh, when I I say that we developed the neural percolation uh, series, so brain inspired uh, uh, graph theory and, and uh, phase transitions. Now, there is a very important aspect, uh, aspect uh, what we observe in the brain and in the neurons is the the intricate link of local and non-local effects. So it's anatomically, it's, uh, it, I can explain very easily. So the, most, the neuron has several thousands of connections, most of them in the dendritic arbor, but there are some uh, long uh, exons, uh, each of them is, and then project to a larger distance. So, okay, and that's, that's quite, um, quite uh, unusual in a physical world because in physics typically you know just think about crystal structure or whatever so the the process is more like a diffusion or uh, uh, or propagation step by step but uh, okay just uh, jump from one location to the other almost instantaneously unless I talk about the quantum field theory, you know, entanglement, which I don't want to get into, especially because I have a physics background. So uh, that's, that's a whole different ball game, but, 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 uh, but really, really what, what we see here is that, uh, that there is a very interesting uh, interaction between the, uh, the local, effects and the non-local and uh, and uh, it is it uh, it is mathematically is very difficult so uh, to treat so some top top mathematicians with uh, which i i uh, i discussed about it uh, predicted that well really describe these problems uh, rigorously mathematically it could take maybe hundred years. So it is just, just so complicated. So, um, because uh, of course uh, you can do simulations and a lot of the neural percolation previous uh, studies, what you did it based on computer simulations and you can simulate this type of things, but, but you need to, need to be extremely careful with computer simulations, especially when it talks about, when, when it uh, uh, refers a huge, uh, I mean, it's a light, we are talking about large system, right? So <laughs> the brain has 10 to the 11 or so human brain neurons, and that is just to start with. So, so these are really, really big systems. And, uh, and so uh, if you, if you do computer simulations, they could be misleading and could be approximation and so forth. So, so that's why anything what you can rigorously prove that uh, that that is uh, that is extremely valuable and that can guide and and that's uh, in the mathematics. Uh, I'm very proud that uh, relatively recently we proved with uh, some colleagues. Uh, some bigger theorems that uh, actually uh, adding uh, these long, uh, long connections co uh, formally prove that it uh, produces phase transition. So, so maybe just uh, one way to think about that if you have just a lattice, like a square or hexagonal lattice, Ising model, people know that, uh, that's fine. So for that, uh, you can uh, describe and there are very good series of, uh, of uh, 
of, uh, of statistical physics and mathematics and calculation theory and so on and so forth. But now, if you superimpose on this regular lattice a few a random graph with, with sparse edges, that the all those theory is, com I mean, it's just, it requires a complete, that's a different ball game. So we, we've proven something uh, uh, of that it has a phase transition that is very interesting uh, consequences. And now we, we work on further along this way, uh, in how this impacts and how it produces these uh, intermittent uh, oscillations that we see in, uh, in brains. So that, uh, that, that was the, the mathematics. Now, Okay, so as far as the cognitive uh, and perceptual processing, so okay, so for uh, for one thing, um, I can uh, I can mention, and that was some of the few projects uh, which we worked with Walter intensively: scalp EEG measurements, uh, high density. So we had the headband. Uh, what has designed and then in Taiwan we had some uh, companies who produce the prototype and uh, and uh, so we, we and that's that's very important that brain uh, brain computer interface but 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 I but I'm really really very fascinated now uh, how this may relate to higher uh, cognitive functions and uh, now I dare to say consciousness, but you know, I'm <laughs> for a long time, especially coming uh, late, uh, relatively late into the field, I was very, uh, to be extremely careful with the consciousness, but, uh, but actually now I am uh, working with uh, outstanding uh, scientists uh, like uh, Bernie Bass from the former Edelman Institute, uh, Neuroscience Institute, uh, but is a global workspace theory for consciousness. So, what uh, and we just recently had some, uh, I consider, extremely interesting uh, publications on uh, how his uh, conceptual framework of this global workspace and the conscious broadcast and uh, and uh, jumping the foreground and then uh, going back. Uh, actually, could be interpreted uh, could be interpreted as a as a phase transition and uh, and uh, the what we measured for decades with Walter this propagating phase gradients and uh, so on uh, uh, at a certain incipient uh, point uh, then uh, they could uh, could. Uh, could be interpreted as as uh, the manifestations of uh, that uh, that uh, uh, conscious broadcast, and I mean this is really a hot field. So just really within weeks or months, we interacted with Jean uh, Jean Pierre Changeur and uh, De Heine and so uh, people in the field. So there is something happening. So I think that's uh, very exciting. The and other interesting uh, topic, and just shoot me down <laughs> if it is too long, but maybe I just mentioned two more, two more things, uh, is that uh, the brain rhythm I, uh, relates to that issue with water when we started with olfaction, but how this uh, brain rhythmicity relates to the, uh, reflects some of the properties of uh, of affection and uh, yeah, I think it's uh, that and now we, with colleagues uh, uh, in, uh, in neuroscience, we published very successful papers, just heard the other day that we had a top 10 cited paper in a journal and so on. So in the last five years, so that's, uh, that, uh, that is good that we mentioned that the fact is the neuroscience uh, component and, um, and that includes uh, both uh, animal experiments and some human as well. So, so that uh, that's that's very interesting how this uh, respiration actually 
uh, impacts on their senses as well. And uh, finally, what, what really I, uh, it's very, I consider it extremely important, uh, what I just briefly call it sustainable artificial intelligence. Sustainable, okay, that's a hot, that sounds like a lozung <laughs> uh, without, uh, without much uh, content, but uh, okay, let, let me explain what I mean, uh, mean about it. So, so the point is, and I just heard that talk from Leon Chua. It happened to be just, just one hour before this interview. And Leon also mentioned that, uh, that, uh, uh, that the, the AI that we have now, deep learning is great, but it is just uses so much resources, energy and data, which is good. If you think that, all right, now what? I mean, I plug the computer in the wall socket and there it is, but wow, wow it's not exactly so. If you, if you just look now for this big uh, cloud computing and so on, they have their own power stations. So if you just compare uh, for the human brain, it uses uh, maybe, maybe 10 watts or 20 watts, like a light bulb. I, <laughs> that's a good example, efficient light bulb, 10 watts. And then uh, in order to, to do uh, uh, similar computation and solution and develop solution, we are talking about megawatts, like a millions times more. And uh, I do agree that you need to be very careful with the comparisons and the, uh, and the analogies and so on and so forth. But, but uh, there, there is something that brains do very efficiently, I, I think, and uh, we can learn about it. And um, so, so that's, uh, that, that's when I talk about sustainable AI, I mean uh, intelligence, which is not waste resources, but uh, somehow as brain intelligence is really the way our brain intelligence evolved, it's within the constraint. I mean, we have a scar. I mean, how much energy you can pump in? We don't, don't, uh, so it comes through, through the blood vessels, glucose, oxygen, and so on. So that, uh, that needs to get there. It's, uh, uh, and for one thing, so that, uh, that means that in addition to neurons, you need to, involve other parts which are on the brain, the glia, glia cells, the energy uh, cells, and then the vascular uh, system. So that is what, what really important. And uh, the way that is building the brain and, uh, and uh, we are uh, developing spiking neural network models. That's also a very successful work area we did uh, recently. Uh, so that uh, that could be helpful to to develop uh, or to maybe uh, impact somehow the ev evolution of artificial intelligence in a way that is more sustainable. Yes. Okay, Robert, you you have quite a record of service to uh, the scientific community. I'd like to ask you a question about the role of scientific societies moving forward. What role should INS play moving ahead into the future? All right, yeah, so, okay, so I, uh, I, in the last uh, decades, I have been uh, actively involved with INNS, and it indeed was uh, under the influence of Walter. <laughs> so he he he, uh, he showed me that uh, that is really important, and uh, and indeed, so the the INNS as an organization, right? So it has been uh, uh, established more than thirty. Now it's almost. 
Yeah, in, in 87, so 34 years. So it, next year we have a 35, we need to celebrate. So. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I remember we celebrated the 30th, it was in Alaska and so on. So actually we have a nice book about it and that's now the second edition is coming up. But uh, okay, so yeah, so the, but what is, I think it's important to see that uh, the INNS was, as a neural net uh, in the Society for Neural Networks is really was established by visionary people and that uh, that really launched the uh, 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 drastic, basically new way of uh, looking at, uh, at uh, both neuroscience and then, uh, then inter 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 designing intelligent systems. So, um, and uh, I'm, I'm mentioning this because uh, uh, unfortunately, INNS is not always properly recognized for, for this leading role, which is okay. I mean, uh, we, we, we take it with pride that, okay, we, we, we provide the, 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 the foundations, but, but there, there is one uh, one important thing. Okay, we can get over that. Uh, okay, we are not properly appreciated, but I think the INNS uh, should play a role because it has the intellect, such an intellectual treasure trove, which uh, which is really uh, uh, very important to. Uh, very important to support today's development. So, I, so what, uh, uh, what I, so one important thing for INNS is that, uh, that uh, get, uh, get uh, actively involved in, uh, in uh, today's this intelligent technology, I don't really want to call it just AI because it's much broader than that, but, uh, and uh, because it, it, it has the responsibility because it was really originated here. Of course, there is a history as well. Now the, uh, I, along this line, so of course for INNS was always, uh, the neuroscience component was always very important. And uh, I think uh, that uh, we could be uh, very active to promoting that, uh, that, uh, that these new technologies need to use and benefit and support the human uh, uh, humanity and, uh, and not to compete or, or whatever. So that, uh, we have this technology to help us. So, and I think by properly emphasizing the neuroscience aspects, after all, if you want to help humans, then you need to understand the, the brain and then and the human computer interaction. So I think that, uh, that this, this, this society has a very important uh, role to play. And uh, yeah, I think we can do that. Looking at the whole field of artificial intelligence, do you have uh, do you have any views you'd like to share? What are people doing right or wrong in in AI? Oh, well, okay, I can just roll <laughs> what I started previously. So yeah, so I think this uh, this whole thing. Uh, uh, what is right or wrong with AI? I, it's a uh, first okay. What is wrong with AI? It doesn't uh, uh, if if it doesn't admit that it's really neural network. So uh, so what 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 is now AI? We are talking about right the deep learning that is multilayer perceptron running for four variables thirty. 40 years old backpropagation algorithm. I mean, that's what it is. I mean, people who are who are uh, doing uh, doing the, the the science. I mean, they they know. And okay, this is oversimplification as always. But but the point is that uh, that uh, this uh, this is what uh, 
what we have, uh, and uh, this this need to be uh, this need to be recognized. And uh, the, really, the way I see, of course, AI from the fifties, Minsky and uh, Papert and Simon and all this. That's it's it's absolutely out excellent uh, series, 50s, 60s, 80s, and uh, produced outstanding results, but it reached a certain plateau, okay? So they promised a lot of things, of course, as any theory cannot solve everything, so it reached, so there was a hype, let's put it that way, for AI, and then it's uh, burned out. Now in the, in the 80s, 90s, if you wish, there was more a hype with the neural network. <laughs> now, now in the last uh, five, uh, uh, or 10 years or whatever, now it's again, it's called a hype. So probably we cannot really escape this hype cycle. Maybe it's part of the <laughs> science as, as we do it, but, uh, but we somehow need to see and uh, go, go beyond this. And, uh, as for the uh, the um, the present, that that could solve a lot of problems that we face uh, today with the AI. When people say, "Okay, they are afraid of AI," and there is an overall anxiety that uh, the robots will take over the world, and then the clone army and robots and all all these things. Or on the other hand, there are people who say, okay, just have more implants and I, I want to become a cyborg. So, so um, I, uh, I think what, what, what is very important for, uh, for, the, for the AI or intelligent techniques uh, is, uh, is that uh, we need them for humans to help humans, not to replace humans. Right? So, okay, so if we take this premise that uh, we want the human uh, to survive and flourish, then uh, please uh, develop the technologies help humanity. And uh, so I think uh, overwhelming and all, everybody should agree with that. And, just need to be very, very clear about it. And then, then it's, it's hopefully a bright future. <laughs> okay, so that's about the AI right now. Okay. Finally. What advice would you give for a researcher just starting out in the field, in particular benefiting as you have from your close collaboration with Walter? Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> so my uh, first uh, important advice: read the book of John von Neumann, "The Computer and the Brain." Okay. So it is already you know, 50, 60, 70, or what, uh, 60 something years. But okay, just uh, it was written by uh, one of the giants in the field, and uh, and uh, it contains very important. Uh, very important uh, uh, thoughts which are absolutely relevant uh, today. Now, of course, you need to be very careful uh, with the with what, what today the people call it the computer brain computer metaphor, right? Because if you if you take this metaphor too literally, then uh, you get to the <laughs> to the one extreme situation that brain is a computer, so you can uh, replace everything by a computer and so on and so forth. So, so there, there are limits, but uh, I think that, uh, that uh, studying uh, this, uh, uh, this reading uh, in this book, it, it gives you a perspective. Now, um, what is something, uh, on, uh, on the research uh, research uh, method uh, methodology. So, okay, I don't want to beat up on AI, but okay, let me use an example that, uh, that uh, okay. So I want, I, I really advise that uh, new scientists should understand some of the root 
principles and theories which lead to the, the spectacular advances. So, because uh, otherwise, if you just use a huge computer code, which you don't even know what it is, it's like a cookbook, you just uh, adjust some parameters and look it up, that doesn't lead anywhere. And that, act, well, I don't lead any good thing I put in that. <laughs> So, so that uh, that uh, that can uh, cause a lot of trouble. So, yeah. So try to understand and appreciate the the, the science, science and the depths, and then uh, then you use that technology. I think that's uh, that's very very important. Now, what uh, what I I think one of the most important uh, thing I I learned in this broader context from uh, Walter uh, that uh, that if you if you have a scientific uh, you know theory or conviction, then you stick to it, even if it seems to be uh, sometimes people attack and gang on you and so on. If you think it's right, then carry on. That's uh, don't don't give up and be be persistent and uh, and uh, and. And that, uh, that that's the only way to find out uh, if you are uh, wrong, or, uh, right or wrong. And as we know, any scientific theory ultimately <laughs> loses in uh, its validity. So nothing wrong with being wrong. So just just keep on doing and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and just do what uh, what you feel really it's need to be done. And uh, you can uh, along the way you can take some low hanging fruits. That's fine, but uh, don't get distracted too much. So you can focus on the on the main uh, main goal what you want. And uh, maybe maybe one uh, one thing to to add that uh, have a dream, have a dream, and be passionate about it. So and uh, and. And, and that's that is very important in uh, in science because uh, of course not every dream comes true, but if you don't have a dream, that surely uh, you won't produce a very significant thing. So have a dream, follow through, and and then uh, take on it. And I think that's uh, that's that's very important. And uh, don't don't be shy about it. Well, Robert. Thank you very much for your, this interview. I have much enjoyed talking with you and good luck with your uh, future endeavors. Yes, thank you, David. I really appreciate the time and energy.